Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Andy, uh, our speaker today, who is going to tell us a lot more about working with climate data in R. Um, so this is, oh, I should also mention this is a joint workshop with um, the Davis R users group too. Um, they helped us with some advertising and, and things like that. So um, we're glad everyone is here. And so I will now pass it over to Andy. Thank you, Michelle. And yeah, thank you to uh, everyone who's helped organize this. Uh, for those of you who are coming today, I know this is a busy time of the, of the quarter. Uh, so thank you for spending a couple of your hours uh, learning about climate data. I'm working in climate data in R. I'm really pleased to be here. I've been coming to Map Time Davis workshops and events for uh, since since they went online. Uh, so really pleased. Uh, I've signed up for a couple of them. So it's it's, it's great to great to be here. Um, yeah, and thank you to um, to the committee and the Davis R users group. So I'll put the link right now. Okay, so thank you, Michelle, for putting a link in the chat window to the slides for our workshop today. So what we're looking at here is uh, the kind of a, a menu. This is a menu for more like a three or four part workshop series. So we're not gonna hit everything. And this is still very much um, a workshop series in development. So we'll get as far as we can. Um, what I would like to focus on will be uh, part one, which is basically introducing you to working with climate data and using this R package that I'll talk about to get data directly into R through an API, uh, which is really handy and saves you a lot of work. We'll also uh, get through um, a good bit of part two, where I'd like to introduce you to some some best practices for working with climate data, because it is kind of uh, complicated data to work with and you have to kind of know how to use it properly, um, as well as just sort of the technical aspects of working with climate data. Uh, part three, I don't think we're gonna do today, uh, that's techniques for working with large volumes of data, basically putting them into a, a local database as you download them. But I do wanna share part four, which is new to today. So I've been working on uh, developing methods and examples of working with climate data in R as rasters, as opposed to uh, tables that you've queried. So, and then part four or part five, uh, also we're not gonna to get to today, um, but there are some shiny apps. You think these, uh, it's great out here, but these links are live if you do wanna practice running some shiny apps uh, working with climate data in Caladapt. So uh, let me go to the first set of slides. I'd ask all the helpers, please, um, please chime in if um, if if needed. Uh, if, if my audio goes out or the questions that come up in the chat window, I'll kind of monitor the chat window as, as best I can. Um, okay, so I'm now at the first set of slides, and I would I would like to pause here for like maybe four or five minutes because I would like everyone, if you haven't already, and I suspect most people haven't. To, uh, to be able to do the uh, exercises that we're gonna do today. So I'll put these links in the uh, chat window where Michelle has already put them there. Um, so setting up your R Studio environment, in about 10 minutes or so, we'll be working in R Studio. I would strongly encourage everyone who has an R Studio Cloud account to go there and then click on the R Studio Cloud project link that Michelle put into the chat window and clone it. In fact, I'll do that right now, um, just in case you haven't used it. Um, even if you are not an RStudio Cloud user, I might recommend that you do this right now anyway. You can set up RStudio Cloud, an account with your Google credentials, your GitHub credentials, I think. Uh, it takes about two minutes, and then you have a working kind of virtual RStudio environment. If you are, you know, if you want to work on your desktop, you're welcome to here, and I'll put these links for our studio desktop users um, in the chat window. But the caveat is, you're if you're going to use our studio desktop. Um, uh, fingers crossed. There's you know there's a setup script that will install the packages. Um, so you click on there. Uh, fingers crossed that will work for you. And then there's another uh, link to download the exercises and the data for our studio desktop. Uh, but you're kind of on your own in terms of setup. You just don't have time to, to troubleshoot setup issues for RStudio desktop users. But let me click on this RStudio Cloud project. I've already got RStudio Cloud um, open in my browser here. And it takes a second. Uh, you know, if you're not logged into RStudio Cloud, of course, you're going to have to do that. Basically, when I click on this 
project link, it's making a temporary copy of this RStudio Cloud project with all of the packages, all of the data files. We'll see them in a second here. Um, but it's a temporary copy. So if I want to save this project in my personal RStudio Cloud workspace, then you just have to click the temporary, uh, the save a permanent copy button. All right. And then you can relax. Uh, we'll come back to this in about 10 minutes. Okay. So, so once again, um, please go ahead and click on that RStudio Cloud project link and, and we'll, we'll get there in just a few minutes. I mean, the, the best thing about being able to do Zoom workshop is you can make these things interactive. All right. But I'm going to keep going. If anyone's having deal breaker problems with that, um, please let me know. But let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I work for UC. I'm with the Ag and Natural Resources Division. Uh, this is one of the lesser known parts of the UC system. Most people think of the campuses and the labs, but there's a whole other division, Ag and Natural Resources. Many of you at Davis might know about this. I'm officially employed by Davis. So this division of UC is administratively uh, assisted by the Davis campus. Uh, we have offices all over California where we have farm advisors and other kinds of cooperative extension researchers helping you know, growers and land managers. We've got uh, nine field stations. We have clusters of faculty on three of the campuses, Davis, Berkeley, and Riverside, and a few people at Santa Barbara and Merced. And then there's a bunch of these statewide programs, uh, some of which you may have heard of before, like 4-H or Master Gardeners. These are public-facing statewide programs. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones focused on nutrition, um, integrated pest management. Anyway, I work for the informatics and GIS program within UCANR. We are a smallish geospatial research and innovation unit to support this whole network. So really, really like it. Um, it's very, very applied. And if you have any questions about this kind of as a career path or interested in opportunities, um, I'd be happy to chat with people. I also want to thank uh, a lot of other people who have been uh, instrumental in making this um, project possible. Uh, it's the folks at the, uh, who, who run CalAdapt essentially, um, the developers and administrators there, and also a couple of my colleagues, um, Shane Fire and Maggie Kelly. Uh, so CalAdapt, you may have probably have heard of it, I would think. Um, it's been in developed and heavily supported by the state of California for, uh, for many years. All right. Okay, so what are we going to do today? My hope is to get you familiar with working with this R package that makes it easy to import data into Caladap, to get some hands-on practice very soon on actually importing data into Caladap, go over some best practices for wrangling it, for working with climate data, for aggregating it, and then to work with, uh, to see some, some rasters, uses of rasters. Uh, I want to, by the end of, in, by noon, by lunchtime today, my hope is that you will have some working code recipes. We're going to do some notebooks. You can save those notebooks. It saves it as a nicely formatted HTML file that you can then keep. So when you want to come back and do this stuff at some point, uh, they're there for you. And I'm also um, happy to uh, share a ebook that I have been working on. Uh, it's still very much in progress, but it's basically um, it's a bunch of code recipes for working with climate data. In R. So I'll make some references to that um, as we go along as well. Um, but if you're a power user or this intrigues you or might be helpful, uh, feel free to go to that um, ebook. Also, looking for collaborators. You know, if you're working with climate data, uh, CalAdapt or otherwise, um, I've discovered, you know, it's a lot of reinventing the wheel. Um, so my hope is to uh, get collaborators to develop code recipes for working with climate. Okay, so a little bit about Caladat. So it is a uh, data portal and a website. Most people are familiar with the website um, where there's lots of these ready-made um, charts and, and maps that you can get. It is, a, it is an official data source for the state of California and it is peer-reviewed climate data. So the Caladat team, they don't generate any of these data. These are all peer-reviewed data uh, from climate scientists all of it has been vetted by state agencies under the fourth climate change assessment, and they're currently getting the 
data ready to go from the fifth climate change assessment, which is coming up, which is, should be out by the end of this year. Here are some examples of the type of data that you can get on climate data. There's a lot of modeled climate data. So this is the data that's coming out of this big climate models. Of course, it's the usual suspects, your daily temperature, um, precipitation, snow water equivalent, and so on and so forth. But then there's also a bunch of derived layers, these mostly raster layers, on things like wildfire risk um, and that, you know, evapotranspiration and so forth. Right? So there's a lot of modeled climate data, both the primary data that comes out of the climate models and some derived variables. Uh, a little known fact is that there's also a fair bit of observed historical climate data that's been interpolated. So the Livni data set is one, and then GridMet is a recent addition, right? So uh, these are two out of, the PRISM is another one, but these are two out of maybe the three kind of go-to uh, data sets for historical observed data, which is mostly interpolated from weather stations. Um, but if you know, if, so even if you're not interested in the future or working with model data, um, it could be a good resource for you. Uh, this little, Diagram here is showing the extent of the, at least for the modeled climate data, I'm not sure if the um, grid net covers all of this area, but it's all of California, all of Nevada, and bits of the neighboring states. And it's all been downscaled to about six kilometers, uh, which is pretty, pretty good. Uh, here's a link here to more, there's more descriptions of the data sets on CalAdapt on their website. So if you're new to climate data, you might be wondering, well, like, where does this stuff come from? So it starts with, uh, carbon emissions. So we're always hearing about carbon, you know, in the in the atmosphere, and that is a big question about um, uh, the future, and that is a big impact on how atmosphere is going to change and how weather is going to change in the coming decades. So those scenarios, they're called emission scenarios. There's two of them that we'll be working with for the future. There's also a historical emission scenario. Those are called RCPs, representative concentration pathways. That's what that stands for. So those are fed into these big supercomputer level climate, global climate models. There's 32 of them that, have been, that are out there. 10 of them have been endorsed by California. Four of those are turned on by default because they're the, called the you know, priority models. They represent the full spectrum of climate futures for the state of California as it was vetted by climate scientists a few years ago. And what those things spit out are going to be global rasters of things like temperature and precipitation, the big pixels, right? Because you know the Earth is big, um, and we're still you know developing computing power. So those models are run both hind hindcast as well as forecast. So like going back from 1950 up to 2100 for the CMIP five data. So we get now we have all of these global scale large pixel. Um, raster layers of future and past modeled precipitation and temperature. Those then get fed into uh, a downscaling algorithm called LOCA. And that's a statistical downscaling method. And it basically takes those 100 kilometer pixels and shrinks them down to six kilometer pixels, approximately. And then those, but it's still like temperature and precipitation, your kind of core atmospheric variables. And then those can get fed into other models, which generate these derived variables, such as snowpack and humidity and so forth. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's kind of the work pipeline for where the climate data that we're going to work with uh, are coming from. So you might wonder, well, how do I get to these data? So uh, at least with the CalADAP, um, it all starts from that fourth climate change assessment and other peer reviewed studies. They've got the data up on servers. Um, there is an FTP server. So if you're really interested in the, in the source science data, uh, you can get it all by FTP. It's in that CDF format. But they also have this API where they've, you know, they've crunched um, TIFFs and other kind of variables. And that's where you can, that's what we're going to work with. And uh, that those APIs are designed for user applications. So in the last year and a half or so, myself and my colleague, we've developed programming bridges to make it easier to work with the data via the API in software environments like R and Python. Um, so that's kind of the piece that we're going to be working with today. Uh, there is a Python uh, library that you can use as well that my colleague Shane Fires put together. 
and that includes uh, Toolbox or JS Pro. So if you're primarily interested in working in the Esri environment, um, that's another way you can get to the data without having to like download ginormous tips and do all this uh, wrangling. Okay, so here's some, I won't talk through every bit here, but the point here is there are different ways that you can get to the um, climate data from Caladap. Uh, the website does have a nice little download tool. So that's, that's a good option. Um, you can pick the data set in your area of interest. Uh, there's that FTP server. And then, but there's also the, F, the API allows you to query like specific locations. Cause you probably don't wanna know, you know the future of the whole West Coast maybe just a handful of your, you know, of locations. That's called querying. And that's what we're gonna look at today mostly with the, with the Caladap R package. Okay, keep on going here. So why might you wanna do with this? Um, you know, so climate data is big data. It's a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, so it's challenging to work with. So that's one reason that, you know, bringing it into R gives you some options to, to filter it, and to just keep what you need for whatever your use case is, whether that's research or maybe a decision support tool, but also converting these uh, climate variables like temperature into more actionable information, right? So that takes some, some data chugging. Um, we can get out of the climate models, we can see what the rolling average of temperature is gonna look like at the end of the century. But that's not very useful to most people. Most people are interested in like, how is this going to affect my crops? How is this going to affect my water infrastructure? How is this going to affect human health in my city, right? So to, to translate that, you need to do some, some data manipulations. R is really good at visualizations, so it gives you some options there. Um, oftentimes you need to integrate the climate data with other data. Right, such as um, census information, maybe you're doing something with biodiversity or habitat niche models, maybe some economic model, so on and so forth. R has tons of packages out there that you can use, some of them which are specific to modeling climate data, like chill portions or chill hours. Um, you can make your own custom models and decision support tools. Um, this little thumbnail image takes you to uh, a Shiny app um, that's relatively recent and is um, predicting uh, when pistachio nuts are going to um, mature, essentially based on based on weather. Okay, then pause for a breath there. I don't see any questions. Okay, we'll keep going. I'm gonna get to the notebooks very quickly. So Caladapt R is a R package. This is a classic API client. It does one thing and one thing only, and that's getting data from Caladapt into the R environment. Then its job is done. So that's a small but pretty important and not trivial task. But once it's in R, then you can use all your other go-to um, data science packages like the Tidyverse, uh, STARS is the one we're gonna look at for handling master data and so on and so forth, okay? So the role of R is, of Caladapt R is really just to get the data into R. Um, it's Fresh out of the oven, so it's relatively um, modern in terms of using, you know, the current um, standard data classes for spatial data and tabular data. It's pipe friendly, as we're going to see. Um, and yeah, so you can use this R package to query the Caladap data sets with your own points or polygons. There's also about a dozen of these preset areas of interest. So just pass it the name of a county and it'll send you back the data for that county or watersheds or census tracts and so forth. Um, and you can get the data back either as tibbles or data frames or as rasters. And we'll see both of those today. So it really facilitates working with climate data in R, but you still know how to work with R. Uh, you need to know what climate data you're looking for, which is often the million dollar question. And you need to know how to use climate data properly because you are getting under the hood and um, it's easy not to, you, you need to know what these data represent to use them properly. Okay, uh, the go-to place to learn about this R package is, is the website. Um, I won't stick it in the chat hand note right now, but it's right there. Uh, there's lots of tutorials, uh, all of these workshops, I'm linking them there. Um, there's this code recipe book I was just referencing to the couple presentations and so forth, as well as they have five, five um, big nets, which are kind of like tutorials. Okay, here is the basic 
workflow uh, for getting data through this package, you need to know your location of interest, right? That's kind of standard. Um, then, and you, yeah, so then you can, once you know that, plus what data set you want, this is the technical workflow. Uh, you need to know what data set you want, what is location, what time period, all of that is part of an API request object that you construct by stringing together some functions. Then you feed that API request object into another function that actually communicates with the server and brings down the data. Uh, at that point, you're kind of done with this R package and you start working with those results in, you know, to get them in shape for whatever you're gonna do next, whether that's some kind of statistical model or maybe a report of some sort or just a visualization. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's essentially uh, the steps to working with the, uh, the data. Uh, here's what an API request object looks like. Um, this is where it all starts. So basically, um, as you can see here in this little sample code, it's a set of functions that are strung together with pipes. And each one of these functions provides a piece of information about the data that you want, such as what is the climate variable? such as what are the um, emission scenario and so forth. We're gonna work through this in a second, um, but that's what it kind of looks like. So the pieces that you need to put in that string of equations are gonna be the location of interest. You have three choices there, depending on how you wanna specify your location of interest. You have to specify the data set that you want. And again, there's a few options there. If you're interested in some of the modeled data, um, you can string together these four functions, include those in your request object. If you're interested in the observed LibMe data, you can um, throw in these three functions, string them together uh, with the correct arguments and get back and specify one of the LibMe data sets, the interpolated observed. Or if you, those are all convenience functions. Uh, you can also specify the slug, which is kind of like a, kind of like a primary key or like a, like a ID value for each and every one of the over 900 raster series that you can get through the API. Each one of them has a unique slug. So that's another way that you can specify the data that you want. Um, you need to specify your date range. And then if you're querying by a polygon, then you need to specify how you want the pixels within that polygon to be aggregated. So you get one value back. Okay, so here's a quick example, and then I think we'll go to um, the notebook. So uh, here you can see we're loading up the package. Um, this is a API request that we're putting together. I think this is for the San Diego Zoo. So we're passing it a location by giving it longitude and latitude coordinates. So we're using the function that does that. Um, the next function in our Definition here are the climate variables. TASMAX and TASMIN stands for the daily maximum and minimum temperatures. Uh, we're asking it to give us back the data for four of the 10 global climate models, the first four of those priority ones. We're asking it to give us the data back for each of those GCMs under two emission scenarios. And again, those are the two future emission scenarios we're asking it to aggregate the data by year. Um, we could, so we don't have to do that on our own. The server will do that for us. And then finally, we're specifying uh, the time period. In this case, we're specifying starting and dates by year. Right. So we, that's a, a fully baked API request object. If you just run it by itself, it'll spit out what's in there. Right. So that's one way you can check your API request object. There's also a function called preflight, which will check that your API request object is error free. Um, so we run that. You can plot an API request object and um, it will show it up there. My leaflet map is, hold on. Yeah, leaflet maps and markdown don't always work well. Um, but that little leaflet map will show you the location in your uh, API request object. And finally, we're ready to fetch some data. So we take that API request object and we feed it into, feed it into a function that actually 
talks to the server and brings down data. And what do you get? Save that as a, um, as a data frame and you get a data frame, right? It's a well-structured data frame. Um, and the number of columns will vary a little bit, but the first one is always gonna be the ID value of the location. So in case you need to join this back to location data, maybe it's a census tract and you wanna join it back to the census attributes of a census tract. Um, that's the first column. Other columns tell you about what, um, what, the, what the different properties are. And then the last column is gonna be your climate value, in this case, temperature, because we have to get temperature. So basically each row here represents one temperature for one date, for one GCM, and for one scenario, for one location, right? So you can get a lot, lots of data there. Okay, so I'm gonna talk quickly through this um, so we can get to the notebook. But basically, if you do wanna specify your location of interest using one of these areas of interest, uh, you don't need to pass it a polygon. You just specify what is the preset area of interest type or layer that you want and which specific one that you want and, and you can get it. Um, we'll come back to this um, if, if we need to, but it, it, it makes it an easy way to, to get data. Um, if you do want, if you do have your own area of interest and you have a simple feature data frame for it, polygon layer or point layer for it, um, you can pass that as well. Okay, so, um, but let's go to our studio and we're gonna open up a notebook. If you haven't worked with notebooks before, not everybody has. It's a form of R Markdown. I don't use them on a day-to-day -day basis, but I do like them for workshops, like all Markdown documents. Uh, I'll come to your question here in a second, Naomi. Uh, like all R, R Markdown documents, there's, uh, you know, you've got your, your header, the, the YAML uh, character formatting with things like the, that little hash sign that'll be rendered as a, a heading level. Uh, the actual code that you're running in, your, you know, the actual R code, you put in these little gray boxes, which are called code chunks. And it's just, it's just a plain text file. So you, you can, um, you know, you just type in the, the back ticks and then R in curly brackets to create a code chunk. If you do want to run just the line where your cursor is, you can click that run button. You can also just click in here and hit control enter. To run the entire code chunk, you can run control shift enter. By default, the output of code chunks will appear underneath the code chunk within the notebook. If you prefer your output to appear in the console or down in the plot window, as it normally does, you can change that um, with that little button up there. And there's another little green button that you can run to run all of the lines in the code chunk. And so I think if you haven't used them before, I think you will like them. Uh, you can run all code chunks above the current one. There's another button. Mm -hmm. One of the cool things about our notebooks is that every time you hit can save, um, it generates a HTML file in the background. You don't have to do anything extra. And when you're all, all is said and done, um, you have a nice HTML file that you can um, save and keep. Okay, so let's go to our first notebook. So go ahead, and if you haven't already, um, fire up our studio and open the project that, um, um, go into the notebooks folder and click on notebook one, getting started. Okay. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so I'm gonna talk through this. You may or may not be uh, able to view my screen share, but I'll talk through. So assuming that you're in notebook one getting started, um, I'm gonna just come down to code chunk number one. So scroll down to code chunk number one. I'm gonna run all of these lines by hitting control shift enter. So I click in the code chunk, I'm gonna hit control shift enter. And it's gonna basically load these various libraries into memory. Okay, so fingers crossed that worked. Now I'm going to come down to code chunk number two. Um, this is also setup stuff. So go ahead and run code chunk number two. This is where we're specifying 
um, our preferences for some function that may be in multiple packages. So filter, count, and select are notorious for this. These are generic function names that are in many R packages. And basically here we're saying, if it finds one of these, look in the dplyr package, because those we use those packages for, um, for data munching. Okay, so now we're down to part one of our, our notebook. So we're basically going to create this little graph that you should see, this little um, thumbnail sample. So we're gonna get some uh, data for daily temperature and we're gonna plot it. But, um, so that's where we're working towards. Go to code chunk number three and run it. Code chunk number three, we are creating an API request object. This should look familiar. We're specifying a point location. We're telling it to use um, the four GCMs. The first four, I'll talk about those constants here in a second. Um, two emission scenarios, um, RCP 4.5 and 8.5. RCP 4.5 is kind of the uh, medium emission scenario where global at the global scale, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions peak around 2040 and then start to gradually decline. RCP 8.5 is a less optimistic emission scenario where carbon emissions at the global scale um, continue to increase for the entire century. So we're gonna get an update, I think, on those in the next climate change assessments. Um, I think they're still going up. <laughs> okay, and so on and so forth. So we're specifying it, uh, we wanted to get them by year um, for 50 years, mid-century. And Tasman and Tasmax are the climate variables. Again, daily maximum temperature, daily minimum temperature, and these are gonna be average per year. Okay, um, there's a pro tip there saying, um, building those constructor functions or those API requests, the order doesn't matter as long as all the pieces are there. Um, code chunk number four, go ahead and type in, <coughs> Code chunk number four is inviting you to look at some of the constants that are built into the package and help you construct your API request. So if you just type in GCMs and hit run there. Um, so GCMs is a constant that comes with the Caladapt R package and it has the acronyms for the global climate models that are available through Caladapt. They have funny acronyms. I've never even tried to memorize these. Uh, you'll notice there are also some 32, um, on, there's some ensemble uh, GCMs as well. So basically those are ensemble models of all of the 32 global climate models that have been developed and recognized under the um, fourth climate change assessment. Okay, so let's keep going here. I'm not going to read through every detail um, just, just for time, but you're welcome to ask questions or come back to some of this stuff. Code chunk number five. Um, go ahead and run that. We're basically you know, looking at what is inside this API request object. Um, it, just, it just spits it back out. Code chunk number six is the same thing, but it's basically there we are. I'm uh, just, just showing you there's a convenience function to change the colors that are used when you get messages back. So if you're, um, you can change the word dark to the word light. Um, if you're using, if your art studio has a light color background. Okay, that's just bells and whistles. Let's go to code chunk number seven. Run down code chunk number seven. This is that pre-flight function I was telling you about, it's basically checking your API request for some common errors. Is the location within the boundaries of the, you know, that covered by the data? Are the dates valid and so on? Did you forget anything, right? So this one looks good. Go ahead and run code chunk number eight, come on down there. So here we're plotting it and hopefully that would work for everybody. So it throws up a little interactive leaflet map showing the location in your API request. Uh, code chunk number nine, um, 
doing the same thing, but in addition, it's overlaying the actual grid cells of the climate data. So again, those are roughly six kilometers. They're one sixteenth of a degree, so that's roughly six kilometers. And it's you know, if you're querying a single point location, obviously it's just going to be in a single grid cell. But sometimes you're querying a polygon. You might want to know: Am I getting back you know ten or a hundred? How much is it getting covered? Okay, um, let's go down to code chunk number 10. Code chunk number 10, we're actually going to fetch some data. Um, you can change quiet equals to true. You could change that to quiet equals to false if you wanna see a little progress bar. But this is where it's actually communicating with the Caladap server and bringing down the data. And what do you get back? If you look at, um, uh, <laughs> Line 154, we can see the first few rows of that tibble that we got back, okay? So if that worked, you have successfully gotten some data, climate data via the API. So one thing, uh, the units, one of the nice things about Caladap API in this package is that it tells you what units they're getting down. So you can see, if you look at the val column, it's the last column of the data frame that you got back when you queried the server, uh, the units are K or Kelvin. So that's not very intuitive for, for most people. So in code chunk number 11, go ahead and run code chunk number 11, we're doing two things here, right? So this is now a dplyr syntax. This is straight up dplyr. Uh, we are filtering only one of the emission scenarios. So you might remember we got a whole bunch of, um, we got temperature values for two emission scenarios and four GCMs. So that's eight times the number of years. So here we're using the filter function from the plier and say, we only want to keep the values from RCP 4.5 and just the uh, TASMAX. Because again, we're, we're coming to make a GG plot line series. So we only want to, show um, a single RCP because um, the obviously the time series for the different RCPs are going to be real different, right? Because there are different emission scenarios. The time series for the different GCMs will vary a bit, um, but they certainly won't vary as much as between emission scenarios. But the other thing that we're seeing here in code chunk number 11 is we're using the mutate function to create a new column in this tibble where we're converting the units from Kelvin to degrees Fahrenheit. And this is possible because the column type is, is the units, it's coming from the units package, right? So now you can see um, a new column after you've run code chunk number 11 for the maximum daily temperature average by year in Fahrenheit. So now we're pretty much set to do a little plot. So go ahead and run code chunk number 12. Um, this is a ggplot command, um, very popular plotting packages. I won't try to talk through ggplot syntax. Uh, you can probably, if you've, if you've used this at all, you can probably follow it. Um, yeah, but basically we have plotted each of the time series, um, as a separate color, I'm using ggplot and we're telling it to use the temperature values. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're gonna skip challenge number two. That's basically, there is a little um, hint there or a little answer key. It's basically asking you to repeat what we just did, but using the other, the higher emission scenario. And let's go ahead and we'll skip challenge number three. Um, what is this one doing? Oh, that's, that's basically the same thing, except instead of the maximum daily temperature, instead, instead of the minimum daily temperature, it's asking you to create the same kind of plot for maximum daily. So that's again, a different climate variable. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. 
um, and then we shall proceed. If I went too fast or people have questions, um, I'll hang out for five minutes and answer questions. Otherwise, uh, see you back in five minutes. Okay, and I'm gonna keep going. Okay, next, let's go back. So I should have highlighted here on the menu for, the, for, for today's workshop, uh, there are links to those same notebooks that are rendered as HTML, including the ones with the solutions. So even if you know they're not working for you or you just don't have the patience to open them up, you can click on these links and see working R code uh, from those notebooks. Okay, let's go to part two because um, this this is kind of important. You know, we've it's not uh, we can do all kinds of data science and visualizations and statistics on climate data. But like any kind of science, you need to know what the data represent and how to, how to work with them. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about data and climate data specifically. So you might be wondering, how can I find, like there's lots and lots of uh, climate data in Caladap API and other portals. Uh, with Caladap AP, Cal the Caladap specifically, there's a copy of this catalog. So I just said there's like 935 raster layers that you can get via the API. And there's a copy of the catalog. It's essentially a data frame um, that has information that can help you see what's available, what it represents, and, and like how to specify it. So of course you can troll through the Caladep website. They do have pages on that. Sometimes it's hard to find. So anyway, so there is a function called CA underscore catalog underscore RS. And if you run that, it, it returns a data frame. And if you run that, you can see the columns in this catalog. I'm calling it a catalog. It's really just like a, it's a glorified CSV file. Anyway, there's a name column, which tells you mostly what it, uh, what it comes. There is the slug column, right? So that's kind of the unique identifier. If all else fails, you can specify a data set by its slug that, that will always work. Uh, there's the URL. These URLs are not that helpful. They'll take you to an API page. It's not like a page that's gonna describe, um, like how did they compute base flow, for example. Um, but then you see the, the date range that is available through this um, specific layer um, and some other information about it. Okay, so if you do want to check out the catalog. I'll just throw this little thing in the chat window here. Um, a good way to view it, oops, sorry, I haven't said it to everybody. Um, um, if you do wanna kind of like, just kind of browse the catalog, uh, I find that opening it up in the viewer pane in our studio is good because then you can use those little filter buttons in the viewer pane. Like if you're looking for the word snow or you're looking for the word like evapotranspiration, um, you can, turn on those little filter buttons and then see what you find. Uh, there's another function that you can use called CA catalog search. Um, that's a function from the package and you can put in a keyword there and it will return a data frame with those um, variables. So we can see here the word snow, there's actually 94 layers that have the word snow either in the name of it or in the slug, right? So I can recognize some of these, you know, we've got the, the Livni data, which is snowfall um, and so on and so forth, but there's a lot of them. Livni is observed. So this is gonna be an interpolated um, snow layer, um, that first one. And then there's also modeled snowfall, right? So we can see that one too. Yeah, and sometimes you just want to see, like you know what data set you wanna work with, maybe you know the slug, if you feed that in, to your on um, that CA catalog search function, it'll show you the properties for just that layer. This is helpful because sometimes the units that you get back are not necessarily clear. So like this snowfall layer, the units are millimeters per day. If you're just looking at the numbers, it may not be clear, um, you know, what are the units of those numbers? Some of them are really weird. Like precipitation is like kilograms per second per meter squared. It's, it's some weird, precipitation unit. Okay, so that's a little bit about how to find data. Of course, you can troll through the Caladap website. Let's talk about how to use climate data wisely. So here's something you could actually try to answer with 
climate data. So according to CalAdapt, I want to plan my retirement party, which my accountant says I won't be able to afford to retire until 2070. But I want to have my retirement party at the San Luis Obispo Country Club, where I hope to retire in February 2070. So I don't know what weekend is predicted to have the least uh, chance of rain for my retirement party. So this is, you know, silly, right? But this, you know, you can actually drill down and get the, you know, the predicted precipitation and temperature for individual days. That's what these climate models have to chug out to get the profile of that bigger climate envelope. But the, obviously the data of, um, you know, the, of the individual layer is not designed to be used at that resolution. So, you know, if I if I was um, uninformed, I might think, well, it looks like that last weekend of February 2070 is probably the, my best odds, specifically that Sunday. There's only two out of the 10 GCMs are predicting rain, and even there, it might just be mist or something. Um, so, but you can do that. If you want to see how to like drill down, um, if you click on that little link there, you can actually generate that plot yourself. So that's what not to do. Here are some general best practices for working with specifically the modeled climate data. I'm not talking about the observed stuff necessarily. Always look at multiple decades of data. You need to be aggregating in, um, at least 20 to 30 years. 30 years is really what they recommend because these models that generate these climate data, that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to model climate. And that by definition is gonna be that daily weather averaged or aggregated over three decades or more. Right, so if your analysis is not looking at least 30 years, 20 maybe if you can, you know, but at least 30 years of data, you're probably doing something wrong, right? You can still go down and look at individual days and say, was this day a frost day? Was this day a high precipitation day? But you need to then aggregate those daily metrics over decades, and that's the valid information that you can get from climate models. So that's important. That's probably the biggest mistake people make Look at multiple models and emission scenarios, right? Certainly for the future, um, we don't know what it's gonna look like. Global uh, greenhouse gas emissions are a big wild card, um, but then there's also those models, you know, there's four, between four and 32 models that you can look at. And there is some variability among the models. Um, the variability is small compared to the variability in the, or the uncertainty about the you know, trajectory of carbon emissions. Um, but still, you want to look at multiple models because there are our best guesses of what the future climate might look like. Another good thing to remember, look at the central tendency, right? So are is precipitation going up? Is snowpack going down? Um, you know, what does that mean look like? But also look at the range of variability, both within models and across models, right? Because that both of those are important. The variability is going to be super important if you're interested maybe in drought or extreme precipitation events, but it's also a representative of, you know, maybe the amount of uncertainty um, between models, if you see that. So here we can see over time in this little graph here, this is average annual minimum temperature. We're seeing variability um, as time goes on, right, as well as the central tendency is also going up, okay? So um, aggregate, aggregate, aggregate. Right? Don't just look at one specific point in time, if, if you can. I mean, sometimes that is your study area and that's your study area. Um, but you're, you're going to get more reliable results if you say you look at a county than maybe you know, this dot that happens to be in a microclimate. Um, average years together or look at the uh, dispersion across years. Uh, look at multiple models. Take rolling averages. That's, that's a good one to do. Spatially aggregate. Um, also, comparing things is generally helpful in climate science, whether you're looking at impact or something. Uh, the, the models by themselves are not that useful in general. You, most of the time, you want to say, how is that different than the past? Or how is this scenario, this future, and that future compared to each other? Or maybe different locations, right? So do comparisons. That's another general practice. Uh, a version of that is looking at what's called climate analogs. And this is where we run analyses that say, I'm sitting here in Berkeley, California today, in 50 years, it's gonna be different. 
where can I look today to see what Berkeley is going to look like 50 years from now? So like, what is the climate analog? I may have to go like, you know, south, um, assuming it's going to get warmer here or drier here, right? So the climate analog is um, increasingly, I see that a lot in, in impact studies. Uh, another question, which is not that intuitive, is like if a lot of times we want to know, how is the past going to look different than the future? Or how's the future going to look different than the past? And you might immediately think, well, we have observed records in the past. So that's kind of the gold standard. So let me compare the future projections with, what the, with the weather station data from the last 30 years. And that might be intuitive, but it's not really correct because they, those are representing really different things. The models are representing the climate envelope. The historical record represents one set of weather within a range of possible um, possibilities. So the historic record does not represent the climate envelope, and that's what the future represents. So what's generally recommended is you can use the backward climate projections as the comparison to the future climate projections. And you might think, well, that's um, risky, but these models have been developed to accurately capture the climate envelope of the past, right? So we, you know, if you're working with climate models, um, you have to, you know, want to compare apples to apples. So that's generally what's, um, what's recommended. So that's kind of the science side, but then there's also like, now we have to also think about how are we going to aggregate and make sense out of all of the possible climate futures, right? Um, how are we going to store those? How are we going to turn them into probabilities and statements about proportions or rates? Um, how are we going to compare them together? And then this comes down, you know, yourself as a data scientist, you have to figure out how are you going to, you know, what is your order of operations? What is your pipeline going to look like in terms of like computing the metrics you're interested, aggregating across time, across space, doing comparisons and so forth. I'm not providing an answer here, but just kind of highlighting that that's, an, you know, that's an important question. So you might be interested in something like heat spells, right? So multiple days of high heat basically what that is. And to answer that question, you might, it's not difficult, it's really easy to get daily maximum temperature for as many years as you want, for as many GCMs as you want, for different time periods, for different emission scenarios. Um, but then you've got like all of this data, right? For one county, you have 328 values for each pixel in that county, right? So your analysis is probably going to say, is this a hot day, right? So you don't have to have do something, you know, write a function that returns was this over a threshold. You're probably going to have to like look for consecutive heat days. And then, you know, you're going to want to num tally those up some way, possibly count the number of heat spells for GCP, for RCP, for the entire county. I would throw this little table up as a general suggestion for the sequence of operations. Um, working with the, this kinds of, these kinds of questions. So first of all, filtering by space, so like what area you're interested in, you can do that when you build your API requests, right? So that's usually early on. Likewise, your time range, build that into your API request. Um, sometimes you're only, you're not interested in the whole year. You just wanna know the growing season or the cold season or when this bug is gonna be a problem, when this animal um, is vulnerable to heat or something. So you may do filtering within the year, right? That's probably what you're gonna do next, right? And you can use the filter function for that. Uh, then you're probably gonna look at time slices, right? Um, you're interested in maybe annual or the water year or the agricultural season, right? So you're gonna to wanna to group your data into time slices. Um, and then you, I, I, I should have put it here, but you also wanna group your data by the GCM and the RCPs, right? Um, so you, that's another grouping. Then for each one of those groups, then you can start to um, compute your daily metrics. Um, if you are doing something like looking for consecutive events, then you need to tabulate the runs. Um, so for example, where do we see like three or more consecutive days of big precipitation, right? For flooding questions. Uh, in the cookbook, there's an example of how to do that. 
And now you, and then you start aggregating, right? So first you're grouping, now you're aggregating, you're gonna aggregate by your time slices, by your GCMs, by your scenarios. And then at the end of the day, come back and make some kind of comparison. So that's kind of like a generic um, sequence that you might, might use, okay? All right, uh, fortunately, all of this is pretty easy to do in R. Well, it may not be easy, but it's, it's once you know the once you have an example, it's 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 not a lot of code a lot of times to to do these kinds of piped analyses. So data, generically, this is called data wrangling. I suspect most of you have played with this. R has got some really good um, packages that are for for doing all kinds of spatial and tabular manipulations. Uh, I'm a big fan of cheat sheets, so these are my favorite go-to packages for, for data wrangling. We're not gonna talk about those today, but we'll see uh, examples of those. Um, if you've used dplyr before, you'll probably recognize these functions. These are good for tabular data wrangling. And again, generic piece of advice would be, if you're like, well, like, how do I start, right? Think about what is the function that you're gonna use for an analysis or for visualization and then kind of work backwards. You know what you get out of the API, you know where you need to get to, and then think about what is the sequence to um, apply these together. Okay, I'll pause there um, for any, any questions. We'll see more of this. Hopefully this will make more sense in, in the notebook. So let's go back to our studio. And I need to resume my our studio cloud project. And then, open up notebook number two, where we're gonna look at some of this, um, some examples of data wrangling. We're not, I don't think we're gonna complete it because I do wanna at least show you working with rasters. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes on this uh, notebook number two. Okay, so click on notebook number two. I'm going to clear my console. Um, and I'm gonna clear my environment, get rid of all the variables already in memory. Um, and we are now in notebook number two. So you have RStudio open and notebook number two open. Find dash wrangle. Okay, code chunk number one. So go down to code chunk number one, control shift enter to run all of those lines, reloading the libraries, this might look familiar. Uh, here we are actually going to get data from one of those preset areas of interest. So code chunk number two shows you the preset area interest layers. Um, you can do that. Code chunk number three, go ahead and run that. Come down there. This is basically showing us um, the valid values for Make, for specifying one of the uh, counties in the county layer. We can either throw it at FIPS code or we can throw it an ID value. Um, I'm gonna skip code chunk number four. We talked about this already. Uh, suffice to say the FIPS code for Kings County is 06031. So code chunk number five, go ahead and run code chunk number five. And we are creating an API request object for Kings County, passing the ID value as a string. And the rest of it should look pretty familiar. Because this is a county, it's a polygon layer, you might notice the API request object includes the last thing there, the last function on that chain is specifying a spatial aggregation function. So we're basically saying, give us the maximum because Kings County covers more than one cell, covers a bunch of them. Um, so we're telling it to take the next one. Okay, uh, keep going. So code chunk number six, go ahead and run that. We are plotting our API request object. We are asking it to overlay the grid of climate, um, the climate data grid. So we can get a ballpark idea of how many um, climate grid cells, six kilometer cells uh, over this grid. Code chunk number seven is actually going to grab some data. And again, you can change quiet equals to 
false if you want to see a little progress bar, but it usually just takes a few seconds and we get back climate data. So this is now aggregated by, um, it's been aggregated for us. You can see the first column of the table that we get back is that FIPS code. So if we had another attribute table with other information for the county, such as you know, demographic data, um, we could do a deploy or join to join those back up. Okay, but what we're trying to do here is we're working towards a plot of some sort. So code chunk number eight is doing a couple different things. Uh, this is just straight up data wrangling, data frame wrangling. We are adding that Fahrenheit column again. So that's what that mutate function is doing. Select, we're specifying just uh, a few of the columns to get back. So we're kind of like getting rid of columns that we're not gonna need. Pivot wider is a reshaping function that's from the tidy R package. And we're basically, previously we had RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5 all in one column. And now we're, that's basically splitting it out into two columns so that we can um, subtract them or, or compare them. Okay, and then um, plot number, code chunk number nine is throwing up a plot. And so basically what this plot is showing, it's the difference between 8.5 and 4.5, right? So that's what the Y value represents. It's the difference between those emission scenarios. So basically it's showing that as time goes on, the divergence between the high emission scenario and the medium emission scenario is just getting bigger and bigger, right? So that's why they're always telling us we, we really need to get our global carbon emissions, climate, greenhouse gas emissions under control. Because the longer it goes on, um, the more and more we see a big difference. Um, Okay, so um, that's what that does. Next, part two of our notebook, uh, we're gonna look at, we're gonna play with some of those functions to search the data catalog. So code chunk number 10 is commented out, but that will, I'm not gonna run it. You, you're welcome to run it. It's basically going to throw up the catalog of raster data in a viewer pane. And challenge one um, is asking you how many data sets there are. So we'll just do that together as a group. You can simply, um, it's a data frame, right? So you can say CA catalog underscore RS and then pipe that into say N row to return the number of rows in the data frame. And you can see that's 935 raster layers in there. I should say that many of the raster layers in the Caladab API are not necessarily gonna be useful to you because it's, many of them are populating the, the visualizations on the website. So the Caladap website, which is um, probably 98% of people work with Caladap data is being powered by their API. So a lot of those are real specific to the charts on the, on the website. Okay, let's keep going. So chunk number 12, go down to code chunk number 12 and run that. And you can basically see here we have a slug. So we're passing it the name of a slug for one of those raster layers. And it's showing us the properties of that. So this, this specific one, it's, you know, it's a 32 ensemble model of snow water equivalent. Um, yeah, this, this one is probably, my guess would be, you know, they, they made this for one of their website tools. Okay, but that gives you an example um, of searching the catalog. Okay, any questions? All right, uh, let's see what more we should do here. Okay, we'll just do, um, we'll just do, we'll do the next section and we'll stop. Okay, so the next section it starts on uh, code chunk 15 and basically, what we're getting here is going to be 20 years worth of daily maximum data, right? So this is this the location here. It's a point location, obviously, and it's one of the research stations where they do a lot of citrus research. So 
you might wonder, well, in 50 years from now, are they going to be able to grow orange trees at this uh, field station outside Vesalia? So let's take a look at temperature predictions for, for this location. So code chunk number 15, um, setting up the API request object. Uh, you can plot it if you want in code chunk number 16, see where this place is. Code chunk number 17 uh, is actually going to grab the data and we can see what it looks like. Um, it looks pretty familiar. Uh, we're getting, so this is 58,000 rows, right? Again, because we're getting daily temperature values. So it's a lot more rows than the other examples. Uh, code chunk number 18, go ahead and run code chunk number 18. And basically what's going on here is we're adding that Fahrenheit column, but we're adding two other columns. We're adding a column for the month and we're adding a column for the year, right? So we have the date, because this is daily data, but a lot of times you want to slice daily data up by month or year or growing season or something like that. And the step to do that, you, you add the column. Um, so that's what code chunk number 18 is doing. And you can see in the output, the, the new columns for the month and the year. Those are using functions from Luberdate, which is a great little package for working with dates. Code chunk number 19 is basically going to, um, you know, create a little box plot um, using ggplot and, you know, using a facet grid function to tell it to separate the box plots for RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, those two emission scenarios, and then to create a separate box plot for each of the months. Okay, okay I think I'm gonna stop there just because I don't wanna, um, you know, I wanna we'll look at the, the last notebook and slides on raster data. Um, but if you wanted to keep going, you can see what's, what else is here in this notebook is um, basically all each one of those days we're looking at, um, it, is it over a certain threshold, right? So extreme heat, it's generally defined as is the maximum temperature above a threshold. Sometimes that threshold may be like based on the biology of say, you know, what, uh, how, what is the maximum temperature an orange tree can tolerate in July or something like that, right? So some other times it's based on what is the 98th um, percentile of high temperatures for the last 30 years, right? So how the threshold is determined varies um, based on the question and the use case, but usually that's how extreme heat day is defined. Um, so that's what the rest of this notebook is doing. And then we're just simply counting up the number of heat days. We're not, we're not in this um, notebook, we're not like finding this, the runs or the spells of heat days. Um, but again, that's in the, it's in the book. Okay. Um, I'll, Pause for a second here, and then we'll go back to the slides. Any questions? Okay. If this is a lot of overload, um, feel free to just kind of kick back and, and listen, and this, you know, the slides and the stuff will all be there. Okay, so I'm going to blow through part three and go down to part four, um, which is working with rasters, right? Because that's another format. It's got some advantages. Okay, so um, come, so I'm showing back the slides now for working with raster data. You might wonder, well, hey, tables are intuitive to work with. Why would I want to go to rasters? Well, the climate data are inherently rasters, right? So you're getting the, uh, the source data when you're working with the rasters. Uh, rasters can cover large areas. Uh, so that's, you know, many people are interested in large areas for your, for your, for your research whether that's many locations or just one big area, like say, you know, the Southern part of our state, that's pretty big. Uh, nice thing about rashers that once you download them through the API, um, they're there, they're there on your hard drive and you can use them as many times as you need. You don't have to keep downloading more data, right? Which, um, so that, that can be an advantage. Um, there's a lot of really well-developed tools and packages and other, platforms for working with raster data and algorithms, you know, like finding isoclines and, you know, all of the 
the resampling your pixel sizes and projections and spatial extractions and joins. I mean, all this stuff is out of the box. Um, we're going to be working with the stars package here. Um, but in general, whether you're working in R or Python or GIS software, um, there's a lot of functionality that's been built out for working with raster data. There are some challenges to working with raster data. Uh, they tend to be large, right? You've just seen working with daily data um, that quickly adds up the amount of data. So you can have large file size. You can also have like hundreds of, depending on how your climate data is packaged in the raster, uh, you could wind up with lots, you know, dozens or hundreds of raster files. So you just have to kind of like manage them, give them intelligent names or create an index to help you find the ones you need. Um, you still have this issue about like, how do we analyze multiple features, right? So we just saw using a deep plier pipeline, how we can like group by and filter and summarize. So group plier has a pretty well developed to do that kind of um, staggered aggregation, computing metrics, summarizing. Um, you have to replicate that with raster data if you're working with rasters. Another challenge, is that um, the files are coming down as TIFFs. TIFFs is not designed for high dimensional spatio-temporal data. So there's some limitations with the format. On the next generation of climate data, they're gonna use the ZAR format, which I'm not very familiar with, but I've um, heard it's kind of like cloud optimized geotiffs where time is a first class citizen. So that should get easier in the future. But for right now, we're stuck with TIFFs. And then like any kind of raster, any kind of spatial data, you know, you've got to deal with your regular um, spatial manipulations, such as like projections, and getting everything lined up so you can you know, swamp it. Oh, cool, Alex, all right, thank you, Alex. This is our expert. Um, I should say that uh, some people might be wondering about the, what's new for, for CalAdapt. Uh, go to the website if you're interested, but basically the next generation of climate data is being prepared and the next generation of CalAdapt API, it's not really going to be an API, it's going to be more like um, Earth Engine. So it's going to be an online analytics environment using um, Jupyter Hub, I think, um, to work with the next generation of data, which is going to be like hourly and an even smaller spatial scale. So they're moving processing um, into the cloud, which makes a lot of sense. Okay, but coming back to the here and now, so to get the rasters from for the CalAdap, um, you know, you can go to the website, there's a data download tool, you can go to the FTP server. Um, this Python package I was telling you about um, is also equipped for that. Um, and there's a link to it here, um, and as well as a uh, toolbox. My colleague Shane Fire has taught a couple workshops on working with Jupyter Notebooks, which included examples um, from this CalAdap Pi package. Not exclusively about those, but those are on YouTube. And I can put you in touch with them if anyone wants to use this. Okay, let's talk about getting rasters through R. So generally, the design strategy is that same API request object that we've been building. You can also use it to fetch rasters. You just feed it into a different function, specifically the function ca underscore get rast underscore stars. What that function does, it gets the rasters from the API, they're clipped to your study area, they're clipped to your temporal range, and it saves them to disk as TIFF files. General TIFF files, you can open them in remote sensing software or anywhere. Um, but in addition to those TIFF files, this function also will create a little, it's called a little sidecar file, um, which stores the metadata. Because the problem with TIFF files is that TIFF files can definitely have multiple bands, and you can give those bands names, but that's kind of it. Um, this, it's not necessarily going to tell you what is the GCM for that layer, what is the RCP, what are the dates of each one. I mean, unless you encode those into the layer names in some, some kind of way, that's what these sidecar files are created for. Um, and they're just RDS files, so you can open it. It's just a list object. It's not XML, unfortunately. I should have done that. Um, but then, once you've done that, uh, you've got now a folder full of TIFFs, and then there's another function that we'll look at in a second that will bring those TIFFs into R as a STARS object. So STARS is a package 
Um, you might be familiar with the raster package or the, the um, Terra package. Those are for more like traditional remote sensing, three-dimensional data. The STARS is kind of like that, but it's, it's equipped for higher dimensional data, which is what we need here because we have a lot of TCMs. We don't, we don't just have X, Y, and time, right? So we have X, Y, and time plus your climate variable, plus you know, your, your GCM, you know, your, your model um, parameters, or maybe it's a slug. Anyway, it's higher dimensional. So we're going with the STARS package. And then the STARS package, like Raster or Terra, it's got a lot of built-in methods for filtering, spatial filtering, spatial, you know, filtering for the, along the dimensions, say, for example, by date. You can, you know, you can extract you know, spatial selections, um, you know, your standard raster algebra. If you want to do pixel-wise summary, so like drill down to every X, Y location and generate summaries, you know, can do that. Um, your standard spatial manipulations like projections and resampling, all the normal stuff. The, um, the Caladap package does have some convenience functions that help you do these gymnastics with your raster data. Um, there's a function that will create an index. So let's say you download and now you like have, you know, 144 TIFF files representing different things. There's a function that will create a data frame. And for each one of those, um, each, you know, each row represents one of those TIFF files, but it also tells you, you know, the file name, what is the GCP, what is the climate variable, and so on and so forth, right? So you can use that kind of as a loop um, to do your data munging. Uh, there's another function that will take a list of rasters and put them into a six dimensional array um, where those higher dimensions again represent the uh, model parameters. And, and then there's another function that will take, um, if you're working with large geoms, um, that'll mosaic. So here is the generic workflow for working with raster data in with this, with this R package. You create your API request. Um, you feed it into that function. That function will communicate with the Caladap server, and then it'll take those TIFFs and then dump them in a folder with the little sidecar files. Um, and, it, and then it stops, right? It turns, returns the file names, but it doesn't do anything else. Um, but you can feed the result of that into another function, the CA stars read function, and that reads them into the R environment as stars objects, which are kind of like rasters. Um, if, you, if, if it's a whole bunch of them, you can make it a, a proxy stars object. So that's where it's more like pointers to the TIFF files. It doesn't actually load them into memory. And then you're kind of on your own. You can use the stars methods to, to do your, your wrangling and analysis um, or these convenience functions I was talking about, um, if that's helpful. Um, there's three big nets on on the website for the R package that kind of explains some of the, the more complicated workflows and working with these stars objects. Okay. All right, uh, notebook time. So let's go back to our studio. And in the last 15 minutes or so, we will chug through and play, you know um, look at some of the working with the stars objects. Okay. Um, I'll pause for a minute as people fire up our studio and open up notebook number four. So fire up our studio and go to notebook number four. I'm gonna close my other notebooks. I didn't say it explicitly, but when you, after you've run a notebook, um, click the little the save button. And then you'll notice in your file pane in our studio that an HTML file magically appears. Right? So every time you save a notebook, all of the code that you've run will be encoded in that HTML file. And then at the end of today, if you want to download those HTML files to your uh, computer, assuming you're using our Studio Cloud, you can just select them. And then there's a download button um, under, it's called export. And so if you want to get your HTML files to your local computer for posterity, uh, you can do that within our Studio Cloud using the export button on the file pane. 
Okay, so, but let me go to notebook number four. All right, and again, I'm going to sweep my console and sweep my, if you are using RStudio Cloud, I would recommend that you clear out your environment. So go to the environment pane and click the little broom button. And the reason I say that is because a free RStudio Cloud account only gives you like one gig of RAM, I believe, um, which doesn't, which, you know, you might run, run out of memory. So start this notebook with a fresh slate. Be my suggestion. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's go to notebook number four, rasters, go to code chunk number one, control shift enter, this is all the same stuff. We're lo loading up some packages and specifying our preferences for function conflicts. And basically what we're gonna do in this little um, notebook is we're going to download some rasters for the Sierra Nevada eco region which was one of the seven or so regions that were studied as a unit in the fourth climate change assessment. It's pretty big. So go ahead and run code chunk number two, and you should be able to diagnose what we're getting here, right? So we're getting um, uh, that big region. It's one of the preset areas of interest, so we're not passing it a polygon. We're asking for live me data. So that should tell you this is observed interpolated data. Okay, does somebody have a different notebook? Oh, Naomi, okay, so Naomi, you probably have, my guess would be you cloned the RStudio Cloud project like a couple of days ago. So what you could do is, I'm just, Grab it. You know what you should do. You know what you can do is if you go to the. Um, okay, that's that's fine. If you do want to grab it, if you go go to the uh, the menu for our workshop, and click on the notebook for rasters, there's actually a little button. It it opens it up as a rendered HTML file. But if you click on the code code button, um, you can download that R and D file, and then you can like copy paste it to your RStudio Cloud environment. So that's what you're doing. Or just follow along. We're almost done. Okay, so that's what code chunk number two is doing, um, is creating an API request object for yearly uh, precipitation from the Libni data set, which is observed um, and then, then interpolated over space. Okay, um, and you can see the little leaflet map that opened up. It's a pretty big area, right? So this is a a good chunk of the Sierra Nevadas. Okay, code chunk number three is where we're going to download um, this data as tips. So go ahead and run code chunk number three. And you can see there that we are specifying an output directory, right? So it's a data subdirectory of the notebook folder. You can see it there. And we're telling it to throw the rasters into that directory. Uh, also, you may have seen it says overwrite equals false. That means if we've already downloaded, that file is already there. It's not going to download it a second time. So that's generally good practice is save your rasters in a um, same location, and then you don't have to download them multiple times. And if you click in the data folder in your RStudio files pane, you can actually see uh, there's a TIFF file in there. And then above it, you can see um, that sidecar file I was talking about. You don't need to open it. Um, um, so, but so you should that probably that went really quick because actually it didn't download anything because it was already there. Right? But if it wasn't there, it would have downloaded it. Um, and this is not a ginormous TIFF because it's yearly as opposed to daily. And I think we're only grabbing, and because it's Livni data, we're only grabbing. It's just one, um, it's just one set of values. It's not like four GCMs times two RCPs, right? It's, just, it's a single value, but it'll be good for um, our purposes today. So code chunk number four, this is where we've downloaded the 
data into a TIFF file. Now we're going to bring that into the R environment using the CA stars read function. And what we're feeding it is going to be the file names that we generated before, right? So it's loading them in and it's what, what that CA stars read function returns is a list. It's a list object and each element of that list is going to be one of those stars objects, okay? So if you look at a code chunk number four, we can see um, there's, there's only one element of this list because all of the years were squished into a single TIFF where the different layers of that TIFF file represent different years. So there's only one TIFF. And if the, row 79 or line 79, this is the actual um, stars object, right? So if you haven't worked with stars object before, uh, I'm sure you, you probably worked with arrays, like your traditional two-dimensional array. Um, this is basically that, but then there's extra dimensions, right? So you can have, here we just have X, Y, and then a time dimension, which is year, but you can also, you can have many, many other dimensions. So we talked about before the, the six-dimensional arrays that you can put together. And we can see there's also spatial information. So you can see that the, um, there's a coordinate system here, WGS84, and so on and so forth. Code chunk number five, go ahead and run code chunk number five. And here we're plotting, right? So this is a array of, it tell us we had um, 21, no, 41, 41 layers. So, we don't want to point, we don't want to print out 41 plots. So if you look at that code chunk number five, you can see we're just getting four of the 41 layers. That's what that slice function does. So that's an example where we're using slice. That's a dplyr function, right? Which we use to um, in deep, you know, in Kibble, you would use it to select rows off based on their index number. Here we're using the same idea. We're applying it to a stars object. And in addition to telling it what indices that we want, the along equals year, that's telling it go to the year dimension of this three dimensional array and give us back, you know, the first, um, 10th, 30th, and 40th element along that dimension. So that's basically what's going on there. Okay, let's keep going. Um, if you're not following every nook and cranny, that's okay. Uh, code chunk number six is simply going to show us uh, specifically what are the units, right? Because if you look at that plot, um, the numbers are going from like zero to 12. And this is like precipitation data. So you might be scratching your head like is that feet, like what is this? So it's not entirely clear, but the units are millimeters. More specifically, these are the um, millimeters per day on average. So this is not like millimeters per year. There's more than 12 millimeters of rainfall in the Sierras. Um, but you multiply that times 365 and you'll get an estimate of the total rainfall for, for, for one year. Okay, so let's keep going here. We'll do just a few more and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll wind down. Code chunk number seven is basically um, getting that stars object, right, 41, values, and we're using the filter function, which again has been adapted from dplyr. And inside the filter function, we're putting in a couple of conditional expressions with the name of one of the dimensions, year, I'm saying only give us back those layers from the year dimension where you know it's greater than 1990 or less than 2000. So, so now we can see in the results where we only have 10 layers instead of 40 layers. We have the 1990s. Okay, um, code chunk number eight. Go ahead and run that. And this is illustrating how you can actually get the, the values of an individual dimension, right? So year dimension, you know, the, the values are going to be integers, the years. Uh, the X range, you know, X is simply another dimension of our um, stars object. And you can see there, that's going to be the, um, the longitude coordinates because X is a spatial dimension. X and Y are spatial dimensions. 
So um, you might wonder why would we do that, but go to code chunk number nine. Code chunk number nine is illustrating an alternative way of subsetting your star's object, right? Where before we used slice or filter, and those work, but those are deep plier methods, but star's objects also support square bracket notations um, for subsetting by any of the dimensions. Uh, there's one, there's only one, so this should look familiar if you're familiar with the stars with square bracket notation. Uh, one thing to note though, is that there's an extra comma at the beginning, right? So there's three dimensions here. So we need at least um, slots, three slots for the X, the Y, and the year, as you would expect with like a regular kind of array. But in addition to that, there's another slot at the beginning, um, which we're gonna use for um, spatial selections here in a second. But you can see here, the last slot inside the square brackets is a which function. And then we have inside there, because you know, with square brackets, it wants indices. Unlike other, you know, unlike um, base R, when you're using square bracket notation to subset a star's object, it wants indices. You can't give it um, logical vectors, like true false values. So which just turns those into um, uh, indices. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, last five minutes. So code chunk number 10, go ahead and run that. And basically what we're, we're simply getting a simple feature polygon layer because we're prepping to do a spatial selection. So you might recognize the boundary of Yosemite National Park. Um, that's what we're downloading and bringing into R using the STV function um, from the SF package. And now go down to code chunk number 11. Here again, we're seeing that square bracket notation to subset this multi-dimensional stars raster. And if you look at the results, um, the X and Y dimension. So basically that first slot in the square brackets, we throw in this um, simple feature data frame that's in the same coordinate reference system, WGS84. Basically, it's going to it's going to subset um, spatially. So now, if we plot that, so we're going to go down to code chunk number twelve, assuming code chunk number eleven worked. Um, you can see that um, it did indeed plot. It did indeed um, subset that big raster that covered all of the Sierras to just the bit that covers um, Yosemite Park. Uh, so that's kind of cool, and it does it does masking right by default. Um, so all of the cells outside of the park boundary are transparent because their values are NA. Uh, if you look at the scale bar there, we're still getting values like between three and five. And again, that's because these pixel values represent the average daily precipitation. Um, and we're picking just um, one of the years, right? So to make this plot, if you look at the code chunk number 12, we're using that slice function to just show one of the 40 layers, uh, the first one in 1970. Code chunk number 13 uh, is basically doing map algebra, really. So I'm tired of trying to, I'm tired of looking at the pixel values that are, you know, the average daily temperature or daily precipitation in millimeters. That's not, I would rather see total precipitation for the whole year in inches. So code chunk number 13 is just taking that stars object that we just made and multiplying it by a couple numbers to get, um, uh, to, get to convert the values, the numeric values of the pixels to inches of yearly rainfall. Estimated, I should say, because we're, um, it's just multiplying it by the number of days. And then code chunk number 14, um, we can plot that. Looks real similar before, but now um, the numbers are 45 to 75, right? Because that's about the number of inches of rainfall that Yosemite gets. But you can see, you know, Yosemite is pretty mountainous. Um, and it's definitely a lot drier on the um, eastern side of the, the hills out there. On the Nevada side, it's a lot drier over there because of the, because of the mountains. Okay, finally, um, we'll do, we'll stop here. At, Choke, code chunk number 15, this is pretty useful. A lot of times you want to do some sort of pixel-wise summary. 
This is a simple one. We're just simply taking the mean. Um, it could be something more complicated where, um, you know, like degree days or, or some other kind of pixel-wise summary. Um, that's a little more. But basically, the function in the stars package to do pixel-wise, like kind of drill down on in one of your locations, or it doesn't have to be a location, as we'll see in a second. Um, but this is, you know, this is real similar to the apply function, right? If you remember your uh, base R and using the apply function in the arrays, you pass it the margin argument. Those are the indices of the dimensions that you want to keep. And then it's going to apply that function, in this case, the mean function to all of the other arrays, kind of all the other dimensions collapse together. So here we're getting um, in code chunk number 15. Uh, now we have um, just one layer left, and this is the average total precipitation per year um, clumped over that the all, all 40, 40 years of data. So that's aggregating um, over time. And then code chunk number 16 is doing something similar. Go run, run code chunk number 16 and then code chunk number 17. Um, that's basically it's the same thing. If you look at the ST apply function, the only thing that's different is that the margin argument, we're saying instead of uh, you know, leave us the X and Y dimensions. In code chunk number 16, we're saying leave us the year dimension. So basically it's taking the, the, the park and for the X and Y dimensions, it's averaging all of the pixels um, for each year. So what we get back is a one dimensional array with one attribute. And then in code chunk 17, we're converting it to a data frame and then plotting it. So, so that's what that does. Okay, let me pause there. We're just about at time. Um, we basically got through most of it. I think the take-home message, hopefully the take-home message is that um, R is really powerful. Um, it's really, really powerful as a data science platform. It's not surprising that you can do so much with it relatively easily, um, including climate data. And uh, you know, getting the data into, into R is never easier, um, thanks to you know, well-developed APIs, and, package. Uh, so hopefully this will be useful. Um, I like playing with this. I'm still very much developing, um, certainly developing the, the documentation and tutorials. Love to get collaborators, um, free consultation if anybody wants to work with, um, with climate data in R. Um, I've got office hours uh, every week. Uh, I would love to do a hackathon someday because there's so much need for decision support tools involving climate data. Um, we barely tapped the, um, the need. Um, it's easy to talk about you know, temperature, but how's that going to affect the stuff we really care about in the future? A lot, a, lot of, a lot of need for that. So I'll pause there and I'll stop and take any questions.